Hey everyone, and welcome back. So today we're finally going to be reviewing Cyber Shadow for the Nintendo Switch. Now, Cyber Shadow was released on January 26th of 2021, and its regular list price on the eShop right now is $19.99. Now, as usual, as we go through the review, if you do end up liking what you see, please don't forget to hit that like button and consider subscribing to the channel if you aren't already. Now, Cyber Shadow describes itself as a 8-bit styled 2D action platformer. And let's just get it out of the way right away. This game does define itself as a tough yet fair action platformer. And in my own opinion, most people will probably find it closer to the tough end of the scale than the fair end of the scale. But as we're going to see in this review, I do not think that's a bad thing in any way. But now let's delve in and look at that. So first, storyline wise, Cyber Shadow is pretty simple. It goes along with its 8-bit simple action routes, but you still get an amazingly simple, yes, I find satisfying storyline. Now, I won't put any spoilers out there, but at the beginnings of the game, you wake up as a cybernetic ninja that basically has lost all its memories. At the beginning of the game, it's a simple game of survival and to keep going, but as the storyline develops, you discover that you're the last surviving member of a ninja clan that was dedicated to basically protecting the world. And unfortunately, a plot has untwisted where your master has been kidnapped and used as a power source by an even evil villain. So your quest rapidly turns into one of survival to one of saving your master who is trapped. Now, although storyline isn't one of the major elements of this game, I'll be honest with you, I am perfectly satisfied with what they did with it. You have some beautiful 8-bit cutscenes to get the story moving from time to time, but at the same time, it doesn't it isn't long enough where it breaks up the action, which is the main focus of this game. And a second element that is actually really positive that this game has integrated is there are plenty of little tidbits of storyline spread out throughout the whole game. Every time you come around a body of a fallen member of your clan, a computer terminal, you have the choice to just run past it and continue on with the action or stop and read a few sentences that will drop little extra tidbits into the storyline. Now, this is a great forethought because those that just want to keep going with the action can forego a lot of the slowdown and stuff that would come from those little tidbits of storyline while the people that really want to delve into this universe can get a little bit more from the game. Now, if we move on to the general gameplay. Now, this being a classic 8-bit style game, the developers of this game really went full power on respecting the limitations of the 8-bit consoles. So much so to the point that other than directional movement, there are only two action buttons. And basically, all the other abilities that you're going to get throughout the game basically come from a combination of a direction plus one of the two action buttons. But when you're starting out the game, you basically only have your B button to jump and your Y button to slash. By the way, all the buttons are remappable. So if ever you want to play with a different variety of controllers and you only have access to a B and A button on those particular controllers, it's perfectly fine. You can remap the buttons, no problem. You also will eventually get some extra abilities, as I indicated earlier, that will basically be activated by combining one of the directions with generally your Y button. However, at the same time, you will eventually also get access to a dash function. Now that dash function is the only one that can be accessed through a third button. If you're playing with a controller that has the R button, by default, the dash will be mapped to that button, but it isn't even necessary because by double tapping any one of the directions, you can also activate your dash function, which although means that they did stay true to the 8-bit limitations by having it mapped to double tapping the directions, just for a little bit of quality of life, because once you get that ability, you'll see that double tapping is maybe not the best way to activate it. They also added a second option where you can activate it through a third button. Now, if we start with what I liked about the game, just a quick heads up, there is a ton that I loved about this game. Not liked, loved. Now the best way to maybe define how this game plays out is to compare it to what already exists. And this game, 
I would say the best way to understand it is as if the old school Ninja Gaiden games had a baby with the modern aged messenger and they threw, they sprinkled in a little bit of Mega Man on the side. And if you've played any three of those games or game franchises, you'll know that those are all classic game franchises that have survived for years and years. And the messenger is more recent, but it was a fantastic, fantastic game on its own right. So that brings me to the first thing that I really loved about this game. And that is the modernizing of the classic, really tough to nails Ninja Gaiden style 2D platforming. Because at the beginning of this game, all you have is a jump and a slash, and you can only slash enemies directly in front of you, bringing a whole dimension of challenges to that early gameplay. However, at the same time, to make the game fair compared to, let's say, someone who's never played Ninja Gaiden before, basically, they split up most stages into different checkpoint sections. And each checkpoint section has a particular difficulty to it. However, if you try over and over again, you'll eventually make it to the next checkpoint, being able to progress. Why is this good? Well, because old school Ninja Gaiden, if you didn't finish it in one shot or you lost all your lives, you basically just had to start over from the beginning. Meaning that most people that have that game most likely have never finished it. So rather than having to learn the whole game and execute it perfectly, you just basically have to break each stage down into in between two checkpoints and learn and perfect that particular section of the stage. Now, this is, however, where the game is going to lean more into that tough section than fair section, because I'll be honest, there are some sections at some points where it might even be normal that you'll get 10, 20, 30 deaths. However, what's good overall is that is not each each individual sections. Some sections you'll be able to breeze through, possibly without ever dying, or maybe just needing one or two tries. Meaning that the game never gets so frustrating that you don't feel like you're moving forward at all. And in my opinion, this was expertly crafted by the developers of the game. Now, this brings me to the second part of the game that I really loved. And this is where they sprinkle in a little bit of the Mega Man. And that is the overall progression system in the game. Basically, when you're going to get to your first sub boss or boss battle you'll see right away that these boss battles resemble much much more a Mega Man type end of level boss than a ninja gaiden type boss and once again expertly crafted each and every boss in the game is going to have a checkpoint right before it meaning that if you need 10 or 20 tries to learn the boss's pattern to be able to beat it you won't have to go through 15 minutes of gameplay before trying that boss again and in regular Mega Man type fashion, the progression of the game is that each time you beat a boss, you pretty much absorb one of its abilities. And in the beginning of the game, these will be as simple as just being able to throw a shuriken or do a rising fire attack. However, where things really kick up into high gear in the progression sense is when you make it to about midway through the game and you get access to your new movement abilities. Basically, you'll eventually get a double jump and even a dash, which also converts into a sort of slash dash. And with these new abilities, this is really where the game opens up, finally giving you access to multiple ways to get through the same obstacles. And I would even say that these abilities changed the game so much that once you unlock them, you sort of wondered how you ever managed to play the game without having access to them. And yet again, what is so great about this game is Although that progression system makes you feel so powerful at the end of the game, the developers have still crafted obstacles and stages that even at the end of the game are still kicking your butt. And they strike this amazing balance where you feel extremely powerful, yet the difficulty level hasn't gone down, it's even gotten higher. Now the overall graphics and especially graphical design in my opinion were also expertly crafted. They perfectly evoke that 80s, 90s nostalgia. Whether it be the main character's face, I'm sorry, I just see Optimus Prime like all the time in that in Shadow's face. To the overall gritty cyber ninja action movie appeal that was so popular in the 80s. I mean, I've never had really a mix to my knowledge of cybernetic ninjas, but cybernetics were hot, ninjas were amazing. Put those two things together, you've got the perfect 80s action movie. 
And although the graphics are clearly 8-bit styled after the NES's limitations and even the NES's color palette, they're used in an amazing way in this game. And those cutscenes, although they are pixelated, they are just beautiful. And they really, really reminisce the cutscenes at the beginning and the different stages of the old Ninja Gaiden games. Now, I know the 8-bit style will not appeal to everyone, but if you are a lover of pixel art style, this game has some beautiful, beautiful design, some great graphics, and it really punches through that gritty, dark overtone to the game. They even added a CRT filter, which you can play through the game and make your screen look as if it's one of those old CRT screens. And as a second add-on to that, you can have that sort of shadow effect that came from having really bad audio visual cables. That's a second option that you can also activate in the graphical options of the game, really trying to sell that old school aesthetic. Now, I left one of my favorite and maybe best points to last, but that is the sound and music design in this game. The chiptune music that was composed for this game is amazing. It basically delivers that punchy, adrenaline-fueled action boost you need to just keep you going in the game. I mean, there's some sections, as I said, myself, I had to try 20 or 30 times, but every time that chiptune music after your death just kicked back in, it just pushed me to jump right back into the action and say, you know what, I'm going to get through this. And that's exactly what you need for an action platformer like this one. So many games make the mistake to sort of leave the sound and music as an afterthought, but no, the sound and music are as much as part of the gameplay as the overall control design and all the rest. Because a game without music just doesn't keep you motivated. Now, I'm guessing at this point that you've already guessed that I really liked Cyber Shadow. And you're probably wondering, is there anything you didn't like about the game? Well, the answer to that will be a yes, but no. And we're gonna go through a couple of points and you'll understand why. So the first thing that I might point to that might be a point that some people will find frustrating is the knockback whenever you take a hit. Now, this is something that dates back to the early NES games. When you got hit, you generally got knocked back. Think of old school Castlevania or Ninja Gaiden. And basically, when you're doing some really, really difficult platforming, that can mean your death instantly. And this game plays on that point extremely, extremely hard. So hard to the point that a lot of the obstacles are set around this one simple principle, meaning that you can't just jump at an enemy wanting to damage boost through it. And when I said that this is a point that I like but didn't like, it's because I think a lot of people will find this point frustrating and will find this as an old school design that has no place today. But I would say the opposite. It's not because a design is frustrating or difficult that it should be put to the side. It just maybe shouldn't be implemented in 100% of the games. But this being a platformer, heavily leaning on the difficulty side, I find it has a perfect place. And although it frustrated me, it also added a whole new level of thought to your approach. You can't just jump blindly at enemies trying to boost through them if you're high on health. And also, the second reason why I wouldn't put this game aside because of that one fact is that eventually when you do unlock your dash slash, it sort of becomes almost a non-issue in a lot of situations. Because if you properly master your dash slash, you can take advantage of an invulnerability during that move that basically will not let you get pushed back at certain points of it. I mean, it's not perfect, but it gets you back to that same principle where you just can't blindly dash in and slash left, right without thinking of the consequences of actually getting hit. And the second point that might frustrate some people is the overall control design. I love the fact that they chose to stick with the old school design where only two action buttons were used. But I do admit that having access to four buttons, they could have easily mapped your special abilities to any of the extra buttons just to make it even easier to access. But then again, they set forth to make a game based on the limitations of the NES, and they decided to stick to their guns and stick to that limitation. 
I was even surprised, as I said, that they did add a third action button to activate your dash command. But I understand why they did that, because with the level of difficulty that you need to use that ability at certain points of the game, had they not done that, a lot, a lot of people would have been put off. So then again, it is a point I want to highlight because some people will probably play the game and feel like, why isn't my shuriken mapped to X? Why isn't my rising slash mapped to A? And I understand that feeling, but at the same time, the developer decided to stick to its guns to be limited to an NES game. And the only one ability that they let you access through a different button, they decided to do it just for a quality of life upgrade that was pretty much needed for most players in my opinion. Now the final thought I want to leave with you before we get to the actual verdict on the game is my general feeling towards the difficulty of the game. Because I did check out a little bit what other people were saying about this game and I heard a lot of people saying that the game aimed to be difficult but fair but certain sections of the game are clearly not fair. And although I already pointed that out and I do agree that there are certain checkpoint sections that are very, very difficult compared to others. The reason I believe they did this is really to make sure that the players develop the skills needed throughout the levels to once they get to the boss battles, be able to confront the boss without the bosses basically being the main blocking point for each and every player. Because almost each and every time that I had to replay a particular section like 15 or 20 times, when I eventually got to the boss stage of that level, I realized that the skills I had to develop to get through that one really difficult section generally is the main skill I needed to properly confront the boss. So rather than improper design, I actually think those sections are very voluntary by the developers and it was purposefully done to make sure that most players have to play through those sections multiple times to make sure that they developed those particular abilities. Okay, so now we've made it to the verdict. So if this is the first time you're watching one of my videos, just to let you know, I do not give a numerical score. I basically give an overall statement on what I think about purchasing this game. If you wanna see what all those statements that I use are, they're in the description of the video right down below. Now my verdict for Cyber Shadow is I'm going to be giving this game a hidden gem. Basically, if you have any tolerance whatsoever for difficult 2D platformers, this is a game that you have to pick up. You, you can't spend $20 in any better way currently on the Nintendo Switch eShop, in my opinion. And if $20 feels like a lot, the second this game goes on sale, scoop it up as fast as you can. I love this game so much, I now consider myself a Cyber Shadow fan. I'm waiting for DLC. I really hope the game gets some because when I finished it, I just wanted more and more. I'm even really hoping for a physical copy because this is a game that I will definitely double dip on. Anyway, that's pretty much it for my review of Cyber Shadow. I'm going to actually be putting out a strategy video for the final boss of Cyber Shadow uh, probably today or tomorrow. And if you are interested in those type of videos, I'd like to hear from all of you. At the same time, as I said at the beginning of the video, don't forget that if you did like this review, please hit the like button, subscribe to the channel if you aren't already, and don't forget to hit that notification bell so you know when all my future videos come out. And as usual, I hope I'll see you all in my next video.